Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Dr. Alan Lindeman. Uh, he's an obstetric physician. He's delivered more than 6,000 babies, which is amazing, over four decades of practice. So we're going to talk about uh, hormones and healthy babies and healthy moms. So, Alan, thanks for coming. Well, thank you again for uh, having us, inviting us in. Yeah, t- tell me a bit about, uh, you know, what got you into doing obstetrics and what kept you in it for so long? When I was a third-year student, and that's when most of us choose our careers, I wanted to, I was ready to go into PEDS, and I thought maybe ENT, but it turns out that PEDS is kind of like adult or children it's an internist and they like to count how many angels can sit on the head of a pin so i hit ob and it really surprised me it was something i fell in love with right away and um i learned a lot there but i had my residency at ramsey it was with ramsey then it's uh, regions now and it's been uh, voted one of the two best hospitals in um, minnesota so but every day I get up and I'm thinking about my mission, my goal, and uh, that's to bring down maternal mortality. So what are some of the uh, the tips and tricks you've learned over the decades to do so? What's well, important? Well, I would say the most important thing is trust. And, you know, you say, well, how do you make trust? How do you build it? Well, the first thing you do is you listen to what your patient is telling you, and you listen actively, you ask the right questions. The other thing that we are missing here in this country is access. Uh, I had, I was very lucky. I had my own practice. I could see patients as often as I wanted to and not get paid for it. Uh, So there was nobody on my tail telling me I am seeing too many patients patients too many times. Pardon me. So anyway, we do need to decrease the maternal mortality rate in our country. 
Of the 36 developed nations, we rank number 33, and that's not good. Uh, one is good. Our average maternal mortality rate is about 19 per 100,000. It was eight when I was in school. And if you look at uh, the Scandinavian countries, it's two or three per 100,000. And so if you look at what they do that we don't do is access. People can have as much access there as they need, both for prenatal and for postpartum. And they have all the access they need for up to one year. Unfortunately, 15 or 18% of maternal mortality occurs after delivery. So the extended care is important. What, what percentage did you say occurs after delivery? 18%. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, is, is there any correlation between cesarean versus uh, you know, vaginal or natural births in terms of mortality? Yes. I would say that be looking at least twice as much maternal mortality for a cesarean section. There are several problems you can get into. One would be um, bleeding. One would be infection. Uh, one would be uh, ligation of the ureter, that is, to tie off a ureter. And then, of course, there is a cesarean hyster, which is a hysterectomy after the cesarean section to control bleeding. So there's risk to having a, a cesarean section. And over the years, has there been a higher prevalence of, of cesarean births? Have there been more requests and more need for it? Absolutely. I don't know that there's more need for it, but that we do it more often. When I was a resident, my C-section rate was 10%. And when I went to my first practice, it was 15. I spent a year going over all the charts and looking at why the cesarean section was 15%. Their rate was 15 instead of 10 and I found that uh, repeat C-section was a big um, issue. So I started doing V-backs, and um, I did get the C-section rate down to 10% at my first practice. So I know what's necessary. So why is it high, and why is it going higher? One reason is convenience. It's much easier for a doctor to schedule a C-section for 9 o'clock on Friday morning than it is to worry about a labor all through the night. And the other, another problem is that we have insurance companies pay much more for a cesarean section than they do for a vaginal birth. And then, of course, we have the uh, med mal who decided to not like VBACs, that is vaginal birth after cesareans. So there's a lot of reasons why we have a right, right increasing rate. I think another reason is we have more inductions and those labors can be uh, quite dysfunctional, requiring epidurals and whatnot. Hmm, okay. So um, it seems like there's all the wrong incentives in place. Yes, we have the disincentives are many. And uh, I don't see any uh, change in that coming, at least not not in the near future. So you talked about access after birth, when that helps seem to, to lower the mortality rate. So you said 18% at birth, and I guess that leaves 72% after. It, what what comprises the majority of that? It's a, it's eighteen percent after the, the delivery, and uh, you still have um, some of the same risks like bleeding. Infection is a risk. Um, cardiovascular disease is another risk, um, and then there's um, heart attacks. There's uh, pulmonary emboli. That's you know when the blood clots go to the lungs. So, but there's another problem too, and that is depression. And uh, I think that if you see your patients often enough, you can treat the depression while it's early and easier to treat. Uh, so I think there's tremendous benefit to having postpartum care for one year after delivery. So what happens right now? Someone gives birth and they say, all right, bye, have a nice life. They discharge you and that's it? You know, that's kind of been the way it is. It's like walking the plank almost. Um, what we have been trained to do is have a one visit postpartum, which is at six weeks. And it's designed that way because the insurances and ACOG, that is the uh, OBGYN organization, they want to just check the uterus. And that's exactly what they say. They check the uterus at six weeks. 
so there's not much uh, there except the uterus. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Well, that's crazy. You have a new baby. How about the baby itself, the mother's health, and the baby's health? Or is that just go to your pediatrician and they'll deal with that? That's the way it is most of the time here. Things get real choppy, real disconnected. And uh, as a matter of fact, if an obstetrician did much care with the baby, they'd be probably punished for it. So you have to be careful. And the other thing is with postpartum depression, you have to bring in a psychiatrist. But a lot of times it takes three months to get the patient into a psychiatrist. I was very lucky in my practice because I had a psychiatrist I could call right away. We could talk about what kind of medication to give or whether or not to give any medication at all, what kind of treatment would be best. And then they get the psychiatrist follow up in a week. So we didn't have a lot of trouble with postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis. And uh, postpartum psychosis is a real big problem because that's when people die, drown. What is it? What do you mean? What what happens? Uh, With the postpartum, the problem with uh, depression postpartum is suicide. The problem with psychosis postpartum is homicide. Jeez, that's terrible. (laughs) What's the incidence of both? Well, I would say we've got probably 5% of depression, you know, per uh, you know, per hundred. And thank goodness there's a lot less psychosis, but you are probably familiar with the name Susan Smith. Her husband wrote a book. She um, put her children in the back of the car. She had two boys, left them in the car seats and drove the, or let the car uh, go into the lake. So anyway, it's a, it's a book and it's out there. Uh, but and then there's this n- another lady who had five children that she drowned in the bathtub. So I heard about that one years ago. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that is postpartum psychosis. And it is generally the result of not treating the postpartum depression. What's the critical time window in order to treat it that you've observed? College, American College of OBGYN marks everything according to time. And so the first, uh, you know, few days, a few weeks would be baby blues. A month to three months would be depression. And then after that, uh, say three to six months would be psychosis. And incidentally, fathers can get postpartum depression too. Although I haven't heard of postpartum psychosis, although there is uh, more uh, physical abuse, I think, postpartum and antepartum. Why, I don't know. Well, if the couple doesn't work together, you know, like my wife and I, I think we worked pretty well together. If she was exhausted, you know, I would take our baby and hang out for an hour or so. I couldn't maybe do much more than that because the baby would cry too much, but I tried to help her so she could sleep or take a bath or shower or relax. So I guess if couples don't work together, it's a nightmare. You're exactly right. And one of the things I tried to do for my patients during the prenatal course, the dads and the husbands were always welcome. And so are the other children. So everybody got a chance to kind of get used to the baby coming. And I think that made a big difference as far as how helpful dads can be. In other words, what's you, what is their investment? How much, how much are they willing to put out or to share as far as the work? And congratulations. I'm glad that you could help your wife out. That's perfectly reasonable. It's good for everybody. You know, you, the baby, and the mom. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, that's, I mean, when 
I'm not a doctor, but when I have friends that you know are going to have children, that's the one thing I tell them is work together. Otherwise, everyone's miserable for no reason. You know, you're let the other person sleep, take breaks, etc. Yep, you're absolutely right, and that's one of the reasons I always had my dads come to the prenatal care so that they were already geared to helping out. There is something that I have called the Tomcat syndrome, which is when the dad gets turned off by the new baby and the new, you know, and the mother, and they uh, go elsewhere for their entertainment. But thank goodness, and that was one of the things I tried. That's one of the reasons I had my dads come in so that they would be invested and they would care about like you have done, like you've helped your wife and your baby. One baby? Uh, three. But the first one was definitely, you know, the most difficult. But then we got into a rhythm. Get to that. So. Yes, I, I know. I have three children also. And the first one was also the most difficult. He was sick all the time. Yeah, when my kids were like, you know, six, seven, I used to tease them and tell them I gave birth to them single-handedly. <laughs> I climbed up on a mountain at night in the rainstorm and cried out and gave birth. They're like, ah, <laughs> which is not the truth. So um, I don't know what, what else have you seen? It seems like, you know, your, your protocols and getting the dads involved really is a huge help. What else do you see as a, is a need that's, you know, maybe not being fulfilled by most, most uh, pediatricians or obstetricians? I would say there would be several. One of them is, you know, there, one of the things you, that's on your, um, list of talk things to talk about is hormones and um, two of the important hormones during pregnancy are epinephrine and norepinephrine and a lot of times when we start doing things to moms when they get to the hospital and you know, they get the big light, the bright lights and they get the nurses running around and they get the IV and that raises norepinephrine and epinephrine levels and that interferes with labor so a lot of times patients come in, they're in labor, but their labor stops once they get in. And they're sometimes blamed. You know, you say, oh, well, you're just nervous. You know, you're worried well and go home for a while. But and that, I think, is just taken for granted. I don't think people really stop to think about, uh, oh, gee, we're causing this problem. It makes sense. Like if I go to the doctor, um, I tell them if I get to do my blood pressure to do it at the end. Because when I get in there, I'm always agitated, and you know, until I settle down, I don't want them to take the blood pressure because it's definitely at least the you know the the top number is going to be high. So I'm when, guessing probably with women, there's an acclimation period when they get to the hospital where maybe they need to, depending on their state, but they just need to chill out for a little bit before they get started. Yep, I think everybody needs to chill out. The nurses, the doctors, everybody. We need to be. Uh, cognizant of the effect that we have on people. And I think that a lot of times we're not as aware of that as we ought to be. One of the things I've always tried to do, you know, years ago, we had the patients get take their clothes off and get dressed up in this little outfit for their exams. I didn't like that because people don't talk when they're that much, you know, um, disadvantaged. So, I'm assuming that your doctor lets you keep your clothes on for a while anyway. Oh, what do you mean? Well, you know, years ago, you get you took the clothes off of the patient and put a robe on him. And I think that always oh. made them nervous and just made their blood pressure go higher yet. Yeah, I mean, that. well, in a hospital setting, yes, they do that if they admit you, but regular doctors, I haven't. Yeah, that's, I haven't thought about that. I remember my dad saying that... Um, Years ago, his doctor would smoke a cigarette, and he'd have a cigarette in his mouth, and he'd be listening to his heart, and the ash in the cigarette was getting longer. You know, so that's, I'm sure it doesn't happen anymore, but I guess it, things used to be very different. It doesn't happen anymore. As a matter of fact, it's been a long time. But when I was a student, I, had to, I spent some time with a doctor, uh, an obstetrician, and he would, he had an ashtray outside of every room, you know, um, screwed to the wall. And he lit the cigarette before he went into the room. And then he put the cigarette down and said, I'm going to be back to smoke the rest of the cigarette. So <laughs> that was his uh, hourglass for how long he was going to spend with the patient. That's interesting. But yeah, I, I understand like well, being in the hospital, um, you know, like when I had a thyroid cancer and my thyroid was out, my wife brought some regular clothes, you know, like loose shirts and and regular stuff I could wear. And that helped me feel psychologically better. 
instead of wearing the gowns and all that because you do feel like a, I don't know, like a lab rat when you wear them. So well, I can see what you're saying about uh, letting people stay in their own clothes would be helpful psychologically. For instance. It is very helpful. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of things we do that make things and make people more worried than they need to be. But always keeping in mind that there are things we can do to keep people calm or to try to keep people calm. And certainly keeping their clothes on, listening to them, answering their questions as as well as we can. Those are all things that I think help to get people to trust us. And that's it. Trust is very important. I learned that a long time ago because there are many, and out of the 6,000 ladies I've delivered, I probably 1,500 of them said, I can't do this. And uh, I said, yes, you can. So I'll stay here with you until it's done. And that worked, I'd say, probably 95% of the time. Reassurance. Have you tried to advise the, you know, the obstetrics board or any boards on this or within your own local hospital? And is there any response or is it just a wall of bureaucracy? It is a wall of bureaucracy. As a matter of fact, that's why I've got this website going. And that's why we, my wife and I are busy writing a book. The problem is that I tend to get uh, serious. In other words, uh, I, what I really want to talk about is reducing maternal mortality, but that topic turns off most people. So I'm trying to do both things. I'm trying to write a book that people want to read, but also with the message that you, are, you can be in charge of your mortality. There's a lot of things that, that uh, the doctors can do or the providers can do with patients. For example, I've never had a patient who's had eclampsia. Eclampsia is when you go from preeclampsia to seizures. So I think that's, that has occurred because of a, the relationship that I had with the patient. In other words, they knew they could come in for blood pressure check as often as they wanted to, but most of them just stayed home and they'd call me with their blood pressure and I'd tell them whether it's, they need to come in or not. So that's one of the things I've always tried to do with my patient is, patients is to teach them uh, how to participate in their care. That's true. Yeah, doing your blood pressure at home at the same time every day, sitting and relaxing would probably be a lot more accurate and done more frequently than going to the clinic once, you know, in six months or a year. Absolutely. You get a much better idea of what your patient, what's happening to your patient. And you know, we don't do bed rest anymore. We used to talk about that. As a matter of fact, 40 years ago, it was very in, much in style, but it hasn't been for about 30 years. But one of the things that's really bad for blood pressure in pregnancy is working a 12-hour day. So, you know, working uh, three 12-hour shifts is much worse than working uh, five, uh, six-hour shifts. Oh, right. What, in general or for pregnant women specifically or... What Which do you mean, and why? It's just not adequate for, time for this. For pregnant women, they should. There's something about being on their feet and um, running around for 12 hours in a row that seems to be hard on blood pressure. And I've learned this by listening to my patients. Okay, so um, what do you observe is the difference between someone that you know doesn't listen and again works like 12-hour shifts versus someone that you know goes slower and longer? What what well, difference do you see? I see that the blood pressure either doesn't come down or it goes up. Taking it easy is very helpful for pregnancy, uh, especially uh, for blood pressure. Most women will do as I have recommended. Uh, So that really hasn't been much of a problem, but it's been enough of a problem that I know it exists. What are you seeing in uh, the young obstetricians that you may or may not work with? How are they handling things versus how you did when you first started and how you are now? Well, you know, the thing, one of the bad things that's happening, I think, in obstetrics is it's a doc on deck. So uh, for 24 hours, there's a doctor doing deliveries. And it doesn't matter who the usual doctor is, the patient gets the, the strange doctor. And I found that there's a lot to be said for emotional comfort in labor. I mean, the security. I was there for, I would say, 99 plus percent of my delivery, deliveries. 
And I think it made a difference for the patients. I think they were more successful and I think they had uh, better outcomes. Yeah, I would. I, we had this happen too, yeah, uh, on one of our kids. It's very disconcerting. You have, you know, Dr. Bob, and then all of a sudden it's switched out for someone at the last minute who doesn't know you, no history, no rapport, nothing. And they're yeah. supposed to do something incredibly important, deliver your baby. Like, that would be very stressful for the woman, I'm sure. It is stressful. And the, the big problem is that, you know, rather than doing things that are, are good for the patients, we're doing things that are good for the doctors and the insurance companies and the nurses. So we're going the wrong direction with that. What other major issues in obstetrics and you know pediatric care are you are you keeping your eye on? And are you are you able to advise on any of these? Do you have that? You know, have you been welcomed in because of your experience and length in the field uh, to advise? Well, right now I'm 74 and I am switching careers, so I'm uh, pretty well out of the hospital and I'm into this um, the website, the book the uh, legacy. And I'm trying to do what I can do to reduce maternal mortality and to increase comfort and confidence. But I'm right now kind of a lone wolf. Are you getting pushback from uh, active obstetricians that, you know, read your book or that you speak to or, you know, what kind of response are you getting? I think we're going to get pushback. Yes. We haven't had any as of yet, but I do see, I see it coming. One of the things that really bothers me is that if you talk to the people who could make a difference about maternal mortality, what they really do is they make excuses. For example, they say, oh, well, you're too old or they're too fat or, uh, and that's not an excuse. Uh, we are still responsible for the, a good outcome. Right, exactly. Or, or better put, we're still responsible for a happy, healthy mother and a happy, healthy baby that will grow up in the best way they can instead of just calling that whole thing an outcome. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Do you see a difference between the, I, I don't know if there are many, but female obstetricians versus male, how do they act differently? Obstetricians, a female versus male? You said? Yeah. How do you see it's Yeah. If it's a female doctor versus male, like uh, how, how does the care differ or does it? You, you know, years ago, I thought maybe there would be a difference and I, I really don't think so. I think that, Residency does something to um, males and females, and they turn out to be about the same. I uh, had a nurse practitioner once, and a midwife, who I thought would be quite um, understanding and uh, reasonable and gentle, but there was really no difference. It was the same thing that you would get from an obstetrician, male or female. My daughter delivered about nine years ago, and uh, he was in the hospital for about 36 hours, and she had three different doctors there, and they were uh, all uh, female. The last one, the one who did the delivery, uh, spent about five minutes doing the delivery and 35 minutes doing the chart. So and that's another problem today. Oh, the extensive amount of time. Everything is time constrained, and especially the record keeping is takes a lot of time, it sounds like. It's horrible. You know, like I said, when I was, you know, practicing 40 years ago, I had my own practice. I could spend as much time as I wanted to with the patients. And, of course, it was easier to keep records. Very, very simple. And today, it's, uh, it's like any exam, you know. Um, you spend probably two-thirds of your time doing the chart and one-third doing the, working with the patient. That's ridiculous, yeah. How come uh, are doctors able to have an assistant that will do all the notes for them, or could that create liability? Like, why can't they have an assistant that does all this for them? You know, uh, years ago when I had my private practice, I had a nurse practitioner actually as a PA, and she did most of the discharge summaries. So it was considered a, a reasonable and legal thing to do, ethical. I think today it's a little different. I think that it would be considered uh, dishonest to uh, have somebody else do the chart. You're saying it would be considered dishonest? What do you mean? Yeah, unethical. Why? What if they're in the room with you and they're recording everything and, you know, they're taking notes along the way? Like, why would that be unethical? No, I, it's hard. I mean, I'm just guessing. I'm not absolutely certain, but I think there are places that would not appreciate that. As a matter of fact, 
I, in my last practice, we had we sp- had to spend a lot of time on charts, and I asked for an, um, a scribe, and of course I couldn't get one. So I haven't had very good luck. They are called scribes, by the way, and yes, some places they are used. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. That's just that's just kind of crazy. So, I mean, are they allowed to be used, or is it just not enough people to do it, or do they fear liability of doing it, or I think or you don't know? A, I think there's a liability issue, and there's also a cost issue. In other words, they don't want to pay somebody for doing that. It has to come out of the doctor's salary. Do you imagine it would be expensive to do that, or who knows? That's all another line of thinking and questioning. Um, I would say that you would be looking at probably 20 to $25 an hour for somebody to scribe. But actually, that would probably save money because you could see more patients. But again, my previous administrator didn't want scribes. So that was the end of that. So what other major things you believe need to be implemented in obstetrics and pediatric care to really improve, you know, to reduce infant mortality and to improve everyone's experience? I mean, a lot of them you're you're saying are completely common sense, and it seems like very doable. Um, is there anything else that you've you thought about that you think is very important to talk about? There are many things that would help. Uh, one of them would be if the med mal carriers would get out of the way. In other words, you know, when I started my first practice in '81, I could do VBACs if I wanted to. Today. You've got the insurance company telling you whether you can or can't do a vaginal birth after cesarean sections. So that's a problem. You also have uh, insurance, uh, which will limit the amount of visits that they pay for. And a lot of people obey that. Especially if you're working for a big organization, they don't want you to see a patient and not get paid for it. So that's a problem. Then you have... Medicare and Medicaid, you know, the federal government could, with, as a matter of fact, Biden with a stroke of a pen could fix the problem, but he's not going to. And then you have things like, you probably are aware of the CVS bought Aetna for $75 billion. Well, uh, who, who bought Aetna? CVS. Oh, it, oh. Right. Big, big pharma. <laughs> and it had to go through the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice, uh, of course, should prevent things like this because that really uh, makes, well, what, what CVS actually bought was the policeman. In other words, Aetna had a, an organization that watched the pharmacy. So now the pharmacy bought the organization that watches the pharmacy. Uh, so I can see the price of drugs going up uh, a lot. So our federal government has failed us a lot. And this Department of Justice thing, Aetna should never, I mean, CVS should never have been allowed to buy Aetna. And, um, you know, like I said, with a stroke of a pen, uh, we could have uh, postpartum care for a year and all the prenatal care we want. But we're not going to see that stroke. And that's one of the reasons I've got the website. We're writing the book. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um... If you can, let's restate the name of the book. Uh, is it out or when will it be out? And how can people engage with you more? Well, uh, let me give you my uh, website, and that's ruraldocallen.com. And uh, uh, the book is Pregnancy Your Way, and it should be out, I'd say, probably in about maybe six or eight months uh, if we hurry. So, And, of course, we do have the uh, pregnancyyourway.com, and that's a supporter group where patients can write in and ask me questions and I can answer them. Excellent. Well, Alan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that too. And good luck. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. 
This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.